Hello, I'm Kenny Fikes, host of the I Know Media Roundtable, I Know That Media Roundtable, where we bring you conscious clarity through empirical experience and reasoned application. Um, so we're going to go around the horn now and introduce ourselves. Can we start with um, you, Jay Sheree? Hi, my name is Jay Sheree Ellis, and I am a mother of three. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist, and I'm a disability advocate. Um, I've become involved in this project because I believe that communication and information are key to changing minds. And I think when we can change minds, then lives will follow. Awesome. Lisa? Hi, I'm Alisa Simmons. I'm a Montessori guide in East Texas. I am raising two children, and I thought it was an interesting ideal to get to know people I don't know and see what topics we agree on and what topics we don't agree on and see if we can have new thoughts all together. Great. Michael? Well, my name is Michael Malovsky. I am a pediatrician uh, in Denver, Colorado. I'm a father of seven, grandfather of almost two, one and one on the way. Um, I was inspired to, to join this group because of my relationship uh, with, with Kenny and uh, introducing me to these amazing people to allow me to find ways to help educate not only my own children, but it help people educate their children in, in this moment that we're having and being able to grow as a community, as a country. Great, thank you guys. Um, so we're going to talk about a hodgepodge of things over time, whether they be semi-personal, um, things going on in, in um, current events and public things, or just topics that we think about or books. But today, uh, a good way to start is just to talk about this moment that we're in. Right now, we're having a moment. And so we're going to talk about about seven bullet points that have happened in the last couple of weeks or month or so. Um, sort of go around the horn and, if, and let's keep that same order we just had. So we're going to start going back to you, Jay Shree, and see what you have to say about this moment. Uh, the mayor of Ypsilanti, Michigan, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but it's Y-P-S-I-L-A-N-T-I, -I -I, Michigan. She recently oh. said something that was reflective of her true spirit last week. And she said something racist that would have gone unnoticed last year, but last week she stepped down. I, I think that it's incredible that, that not only was it noticed, but that she understood that the expectation is that it needs to be corrected, even though she couldn't exercise the discretion not to make an inappropriate or, or remark or something that would be perceived as racist. Um, obviously she understood that this is no longer acceptable. And I think that for as tumultuous as the times are, I think it speaks volumes that we now actually do see people losing jobs um, or voluntarily stepping down because they realize that something has been done that disenfranchises another community. And I think that's, we've come a long way in that respect. I think we still have a lot of work to do, but I think it's encouraging that she stepped down and that she knew she would be expected to do so. Right. Okay. Alisa, what do you think of that? Shall I read it again? Um, no, I have it. Um, well, so I did not know this happened. What did she say? I actually don't know what she said. I was just putting together some bullet points of, of last week's events. So well, I, I think that, have had that. Yeah, um, I would be interested. That's what I was looking over here, trying to see if I could see what she said. I think that it's I would love to see what it is she said and then what her track history was. But I think the fact that she stepped down rather than drawing it out and making it a, a big ordeal and, and, you know, sticking her feet in the ground, what it is a sign of the time that she was like, Nope, you know, right here, right now, this is not where I get to be. I lost my power because people are going to call me on my racism now. And I think it's becoming more of a, more acceptable to do so. So yeah, I'm looking to see what she said so we could maybe add that in because I'd be interested to see what she said. Sure, good question. What do you think, Michael? You know, I, I'd like to connect this to, I, I know that we can't, we're not gonna rehash all of our discussion at the end of last time, but I think that this is a very good example of what we were all discussing, which is this is a, a type of symbolic gesture and we're seeing lots more of them 
there's lots more. I'm not going to say superficial. Superficial belittles it because this would not have occurred. The same thing wouldn't have occurred even five years ago. It would have been. It wouldn't have even been on the probably not even the front page of the Detroit newspaper. Now it's national news, but um, it's still one, it's still part of this kind of initial adolescence of this process that we're seeing, where we're seeing lots of symbolism, lots of of window dressing actions, but when. How are any of these things going to be moved to the next level to become um, really ingrained and, 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 and cultural and societal in a way that moves the needle for everybody and not, just, and not just these very nice and very meaningful gestures, but it, it's, still, it's still not, it's still, it's still pretty low level. I, I want to get everybody else's thoughts on that. Gotcha. Well, I was able to see what I think it was. I, I, uh, I found it on ABC News to go. Um, it said that she, since I'll be crucified if I vote against any black person on any commission, I'm going to vote. I'm going to go, uh, vote yes. Is is what it sounds like she said at the time. So sadly, her and and so, I think. I wonder why. She, I don't know. Like, with that can't be everything she said. Yeah. So so let's not. Yeah. So we don't. So we don't know what she said right now. But uh, the 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 major point yeah. here. And you had a good question. I should have been prepared with the with the answer to that. But the idea is simply that something happened versus dragging it out, like we saw the uh, yeah. of of Virginia do about two years ago. They are not going to step down. Uh, speaking to Michael's uh, conversation about it being symbolic. Albeit I agree with that, I think, um, and also as a, as a black person in this country, um, you know, the whole conversation about 400 years is a long time to wait. And so let's move now. It's not about taking the right time. Um, I recall before apartheid ended in South Africa, people used to say it's not the right time. And I would say, hey, you know, if I'm beating you up, do you want me to stop at the right time or right now? And so I'm certainly not taking that, that position, but I will say that because we are in this moment and I feel something happening that I have not seen and felt before, these are beginnings. These are the beginnings of that fire that burns against injustice. So that ember starts somewhere, but it is important to continue to point out that gestures aren't good enough. Yet holding people accountable is certainly a tremendous start based upon what we've had before which was not accountability. And so while these points that I'll go through today are similar and you could sort of paste the same answer to them, we might look at the difference um, in what those scenarios are. Like this next one is an adult leading young adults. Um, and so how that is, 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 is affected as well. So I'll read that one. Um, the next one is the general manager of of a Florida professional softball team, used her team in a photo to promote her Trump and anti-Black Lives Matter stance on Twitter. The entire, the entire team quit, but only two players were Black. So what, what do you guys think of that? So same order. Well, I mean, I think it's hard to know exactly why they quit. Um, we would like to think that um, they, they quit because they felt it was wrong and that they would have quit whether there were two Black players on the team or none. Um, but it's quite possible that they quit because they were close to two black people on that team. And they, they could see their humanity because they know them and they play with them and those are their friends. And they don't think of them as black people, but these are their friends that they care about. And it might have just been an act of solidarity for that reason. Um, I think it would be interesting to know exactly why each family decided to either withdraw their children or, did the, or were the children old enough to speak up and say, I don't want to be a part of this. They understand what's going on. Um, but I do also commend parents for allowing their kids to quit, right? Because we have to let them. We have to let them step away. And, and I'm sure that there were probably some troubled conversations over that because I would imagine that there were some people who wondered what their inner circle would think um, because, you know, invariably there's somebody in the inner circle who probably um, might have some prejudicial thinking and wouldn't appreciate um, an entire team stepping down because black people would feel offended. So I commend the kids and their parents. Right, right. 
And to be clear, it was when I said young adults, I, it, the, the information I got is that it was a professional team. So I'm, I'm thinking that they're just young adults, but, Very nice. but was, same, points are, same points are taken. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know what? I think that in today's world, I think our generation um, going closer to 40 and above need to realize that young 20 year olds, most of them grew up with hip hop. Most of them grew up with extreme, not extreme, but uh, an exposure to different cultures than older generations did because the internet, they've had the phone in their pocket their entire time. And I think that it's going to be harder to keep young 20 year olds quiet and submissive in situations like this. And I think they were like, no, we're, you know, we're not, we're going to draw a line in the sand and you don't get to use our face to be racist. You don't get to use our team picture to be racist. So I think it's, it's a sign of hope for this generation. And, and I also, Jay, am, uh, and are with you. I, I, I'm commend them all for saying, no, it didn't take two pictures. It took one. It was like, we're done. If you're our coach, we're done. So I, I think it was a great thing that they did as a team. Gotcha. Okay, Michael? You know, I'm also going to connect this back to a prior conversation. We, we covered so much ground last time, but I think this speaks to the power of relationships. You know, I think that we talked about, um, you know, at the end of last session about how just it's impossible to have a preconceived picture or view of somebody that you can hold on to once you have a real relationship with them. And what better sports, you know, as, as people who are athletes, you know, Kenny and I were college athletes, there's no better venue for people from wildly different backgrounds who suffer and spend lots of time together to have a real relationship. And through that relationship, you really gain an enormous amount of insight and understanding that's impossible from just reading about it or, or, or having, oh, well, you know, I had, I, I have my, my, in the office, I have a black guy that sits next to me. So I, I feel like I'm woke. There's something that you have, these people had real deep, meaningful relationships with each other and two of their number were, uh, I think, severely uh, injured by this in, in a real way. And every single person there, because of their relationship, felt it personally, felt it deeply on an emotional level and not just on, well, I, I think I should react this way. I think this is the right thing to do. It wasn't like that at all. It was a, and, and, and those kind of interactions, relationships and reactions, emotional, on the emotional level, are what's really going ultimately to affect change on both sides, I think. But then yeah. I think we have to ask what happened with Colin Kaepernick, if it's about- Sure, sure, he was ahead of the game. Uh, people changed his narrative. We talked about that last time. And I think it's fine to go, you know, um, over the last conversations we had, Michael, there's no apologies for that to be made. But I've always said, and anyone who's played sports knows that it is a tremendous way to meet people and not only meet people, but to love people. You grow to love your teammates. And I guarantee you, nothing about your teammate has to do with race. Um, you may joke with each other, just like you joke with siblings. I didn't grow up with siblings, but, but having teammates is like having brothers. And so I don't know, I may kid on Michael because I think he has a slow step to the left or something, but it's not race, okay. right? Or he may kid with me because he thinks I travel all the time and the ref doesn't call it, right? Or we may kid with someone because he's getting killed and we're like, you can't guard that guy, he's killing you, right? But none of that is about race. And when those people hurt, you hurt. Um, and you know their value, just like people in your family. You know one person may be better at negotiating a deal and another person may be better at talking to someone when they're down because they have more empathy. So those are the things that you develop in your relationships with teammates. So that is really um, strong. Uh, teammates are also people who you may kill them in practice, but no one else better jump on them in a game, right? So um, sports is a perfect place for that to happen. Absolutely. So I think history has proven you right, Michael, because throughout time we've seen sports teams that have been able to change the narrative because of the brotherhood or sisterhood they create on their teams. True, truly, yeah. absolutely. And um, yeah, I, we used to, there used to be, in, in, in our practices, and listen, I, don't get me wrong, Penn is not Duke, okay? It's not North Carolina. Kenny knew all the guys that I played with. Like, we, we were nice guys. We all had career aspirations. We played pretty hard, but no one was in danger of going pro. But yet, there were, there were fist fights every week, every week. And it was part of the dynamic. And, 
and you could, so you could have that much anger towards one another. You could have that, that much strong emotions being exchanged every day. And when you leave the building, you are closer than ever. And it's really hard for people to process that, but it is just like your siblings. We, you know, I, I had one sibling, I have seven kids here. They fight constantly, but they love each other deeply. And you, and, and, it, and whenever I, when I saw this story, Kenny, when you, when you sent it to me, I, I'd heard about it a little bit. That was the first thing that jumped to mind is this is an example of things that we can foster and do communally, nationally, on every level that can move the needle. Relationships, emotional connections, because it's really impossible to say the kind of things like the Ypsilanti person did if she had any deep emotional or meaningful relationship with anybody who wasn't like her. That's right. Good deal. All right, so the third thing in this moment that we're having. This is a huge one. Uh, Michael, a little bit about one of our recent conversations as well. The state of Mississippi has a state flag that has the Confederate symbol on it. The state Senate just voted in favor of taking it down and changing it. And as we all know, the state of Mississippi did this after having rejected this notion multiple times over many years since the 60s and probably before. Tell me. Um, I was amazed. I read about this and I read a couple articles about it that they're actually removing the Confederate flag from their flag. Um, I was amazed simply because there's still so much discussion and debate about it. Like, I, I feel like it, it shouldn't even be um, a consideration at this point because we've had so much discussion about it and, and it's been explained why this is hurtful. Um, but I was surprised that, it, that a Senate would vote to do this. This wasn't like one person and an executive order, this was the Senate of a state. It wasn't just let's take this one monument down from this park or from this library. This represents the entire state, a state that is well noted for a history of, of significant racism and oppression. And so, um, and that's the kind of thing that I think gives you hope. Because I think when, when we're on a journey like this, we have to remember that it takes a long time to change things. It takes a long time to change minds. It takes a long time to change policy. Um, and so when you start to see things happen kind of that quickly, and I know it's been ongoing, but I mean, I think that was the result of all of what has happened lately, like in the last six months or so. Um, and so it's amazing to see that significant a change for that state so quickly. And that gives me hope. That means to me, we need to continue the conversations. We need to continue the hard conversations. And we need to, con to really continue pressing our elected officials to, to do what we think is the right thing. Great. Well you know said. what, I wonder if, because so the Confederate flag is one of my pet peeves and has been since I was like 15. Um, so I've, I never could understand why any government office would have the Confederate flag there. Um, so for, so as much as I'm excited that Mississippi finally got rid of it, I'm also the, the prick inside of me is like, well, did they do this because now at military graduations, they couldn't fly their flag. So there's that. I'm real proud that they did it, but then it's like did, and I'm ultimately, I'm just glad they did it. But then that, and the antagonist inside of me is just like, well, they only did it because they wouldn't get their flags at Navy, you know, the Navy graduations. They couldn't, have their flag fly at NASCAR anymore. So they wanted to be represented. And then, but my mom would say, well, at least you got what you wanted. So it's off, but then I don't know if I give the state credit. Like, <laughs> I'm glad they did, but I just, I think they had to, cause that's what society was telling them it was time. So I'm glad they did it, but I question their motives. Okay. Well, thank Michael. No, um, the flag, I shared with you guys how the flag issue is very close, not just to me, but I think most people in the Jewish community who have relatives that were either slaughtered or who survived the Holocaust, because there is a completely equivalent symbol that, that generates the exact same feeling. So it is a very, I feel very personally connected to that issue uh, as well. So why now? You know, in 2020 right now, yes, there's there's all this moment and, and maybe it was a, a but it, maybe it was a knee jerk thing, but I was struck by something. Now, Kenny, I sent you a video. I don't think you saw it. There was a, you guys remember the Phil Donahue show? Yeah. Like 70s and 80s. 
So there was a clip. Phil Donahue had Louis Farrakhan on in 1989. And he was taught, and it, it literally could have been recorded yesterday in terms of the topic. It was, did you, I don't know, did you see it? At least I've seen the clip recently. Yeah, it's amazing. Okay. And yeah, and he literally could, and, and one of the, and he makes so many amazing points. Like if you, if you put aside whatever you feel about the NOI and Louis Farrakhan, whatever being, you know, but the way, what he said and how he expressed it, was so spot on, but he, one of the points he made was that black people and white people in America, one of the major disconnects is that they're not perceiving the same realities the same way. The, the same situations are being looked at from, from the white side of the ball um, or the non-black side of the ball. Completely, like the flag is a great example. For so long, this group saw this reality one way and another group had a completely different reality and perception of the exact same thing. And, but, and, and because that lived that way, no one, no one cared. No one, no one gave a rat's ass about it. And now all of a sudden, what's happening now is allowing people to, to take down the barrier, to see the blind spots and to go, wow, it, I really do get it in a way that I may not have gotten it when I looked at the exact same reality five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Yeah, and I think um, I'll go with the a little his, history and then a little cynicism. Um, so the his, history of it, yes, I think people, even people of color just became apathetic about it because everyone felt like, well, what are we going to do about it? <laughs> um, just today, this very day in a business situation, um, two times. So when we talk about having a moment, not once today and not yesterday, twice today, I was dealing with a gentleman who's in sales in a particular company. And he's a nice guy. He said to me, you know, he's, he said, Kenny, what do you think of all the stuff going on? And the conversation led to one thing. And, and then he asked, but what about people sort of putting away their history and forgetting their history? And I said, listen, you can't forget your history. No one's going to forget history. And then I did the analogy with Auschwitz. And I was like, listen, it's not forgotten, but no one's celebrating any of the SS's commanders and, 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 and um, generals, et cetera. You know, you, we know the history. Everyone can talk to you about the Holocaust and what happens, but no one's running around celebrating these guys. Um, and it seemed to me that instead of talking so much about black and white, I talked about the word celebrating, and then I talked about what the, the, the Civil War was fought about. It was about agriculture. It was about keeping people like me as free labor um, to, in the South. And so let's not get it confused and talk about and, and say that it was about heritage um, and culture in the South. It was about keeping people like me in bondage. And so for me to want to celebrate a guy on a horse who fought for that makes no sense. So it's not about forgetting your history and throwing your history away. away. We cannot forget it. It's about not celebrating those people. And that word celebrate seemed to really resonate with him. And so he was being fair and honest and curious, and he felt like he could approach me about it because I've known him for a while. The other gentleman, um, the conversation was a little bit similar, um, and he, he started trying to go into things about heritage, and I did the exact same thing because earlier I'd learned that the word celebrated resonated with that guy and the same thing. So I learned something today about that word specifically on my toes in that. The cynical part, as Elisa says, I think about a state like Mississippi and I think about Tennessee and I think about schools like Oklahoma. Um, Oklahoma's in the big 12 conference, but Tennessee and Alabama and Mississippi and Mississippi state are in the Southeastern conference. And I think about a conversation I had in the last 12 months with someone about Tennessee and football. Um, you know, football is king and powerful, you know, it, it runs a lot of things in universities, not only revenue, but school pride. People from out of state go to LSU because of football, not because they know anything about the university, really, and, and other schools. People go to the University of North Carolina because of basketball. So what's my point? Someone asked me something to the effect of how does Oklahoma continue to do what they do? And Tennessee has had such a tough run. And my answer was, as someone with some knowledge of it, but not pretending to be an expert, I said, listen, I think Tennessee has a culture problem. And they said, what do you mean by that? I said, well, look at a situation a few years ago at the University of Oklahoma, where some frat kid had on blackface and did whatever he did 
the president of the University of Oklahoma, David Bourne at the time, immediately, no pass, no, no stop and collect your change and, you know, whatever. It's no pay. Boom, those people were done and they were out. Tennessee, same type issues. Well, you know, boys will be boys and they're young and yada, 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 and we're sorry. And, and, and it's washed over. And I said to this person, if you believe that these black parents sending their boys to play football at these schools don't pay attention to that kind of stuff, you're kidding yourself. And so when a school has a culture problem like that, I think it matters in the football team. Um, Nick Saban at Alabama, they've done a great job. Nick Saban has taken these kind of stances before. I don't think I heard him say Black Lives Matter, but he seems to love his kids. Mike Krzyzewski at Duke, same thing. He seems to love his kids. Um, and that matters. Yes, the X's and O's matter. But I think, as Elisa is saying, why did they do it? I mean, I'm okay that they do it for whatever, did it for whatever yes, reason. Yeah. But, but I believe a school, a, a state like Mississippi, I, I'm pretty sure they're thinking about those football teams and stuff. Yeah. I, yeah. I think that's a part of it. I really do. Not just business. You know what? And I think when you go back to the conversation about the Confederate flag, it goes back to last week, Kenny, when you were talking about the narrative. When, when Southern, because regularly do I get into a conversation, as you said, pointed out today twice, I regularly get into the conversation where I'm like, no, if you try to tell me the Civil War was anything about Trump other than the financial gain of the South based on their benefit of enslaving people, then I can't continue this conversation with you because your narrative is completely wrong and you're, do, you're believing something so that you feel comfortable with flying that flag. And I think it goes back to what you were saying last week when their narrative isn't based on historic contents, but an interpretation that's been passed down so that they can feel good about something that history would tell them not to feel good about. <laughs> and I think even if you look at that concept of celebration, you know, if you want to say that it's the Southern heritage, let's just give them that. The Southern heritage, that's what they're celebrating with the Confederate flag. Um, well, Black people might not want to celebrate that Southern heritage, right? Because for us, it's not just about mint juleps and, you know, evening spent out under the magnolia trees. Like this is a heritage that was very, very oppressive and violent um, for a really long time. So let's say it is about Southern heritage. It's, mm -hmm. it's not the type of Southern heritage that we would find um, celebratory and that we want to be reminded of right. every time right. we walk into a building. So, Kenny, I, I want to I ask you a question related to this because, you know, listen, I, I follow college sports you know, with some sort of frequency. The SEC as a group, every one of these states, you know, we talk about celebrating what and my impression is that all these communities, let's say the community, the communities around Kentucky, Tennessee, Mississippi State, um, Alabama, these, what, what to me it seems, and maybe I'm just seeing it because that's what the media shows, the, there is intense celebration and emotional connection to football and yes. what these people do. And it, is, and it is not small. And these, these, in most of these communities, it seems to me, that when, when there are games, it is literally the biggest thing going on in the state at that time. Am I, Absolutely. And, and yet, <clears throat> and for a long time, it's not new, but the vast majority of these teams are comprised of black athletes, like, like 99%. That's right. And so these communities are, are used to rallying around and celebrating uh, around these things, it, these, this community of athletes that is all African-American. Sure. And so it seems to me that each one of these programs, each one of these athlete communities has an enormous voice that they're not using. It has an enormous- yes. be, be, Because well, I think they take a position oftentimes, they lump it in with, let's not talk about religion and let's not talk about politics. You know, so many people say those things. So they yeah. say, let's keep it about the game. Let's keep it about the sport. And they pretend that race isn't a huge part of sports and when you say it's huge and it's the biggest thing going on in the state absolutely i mean you look at a place like georgia where bill, where bill dooley back in the day i think it was bill dooley became governor you look at um nebraska where tom osborne became a u.s senator um or was he in the house of Repre representatives sure. <clears throat> and there are other states where people don't run for anything but i can guarantee you that um 
here in Tennessee at a certain time and Phil Farmer had run for governor, he'd have won. I can guarantee you, I shouldn't say guarantee you, but I think Bob Stoops in Oklahoma or Barry Switzer, if they'd run for governor or U.S. Senate, they'd have won. It's he, just he would. He'd win in office. He'd win office in Tennessee. Absolutely. And so um, they, they've tried to put it in those conversations and keep it about the money and as non-controversial as possible. But it's, it's like celebrating a racehorse, right? Let's be real about it. Uh, yeah. um, you don't think that your racehorse is equal with you and has human rights, but you yeah. love that racehorse, right? And so I, I don't, this could be a whole show, so I won't go all the way down this rabbit hole, but I can tell you about a part of my personal development out of high school. I started taking on these thoughts early, sooner than later. Some people arrive at these places at 30 years old. At 19, I was starting to think because I'd spent a lot of time at college football games and basketball games. And I could hear stuff that people didn't think was, race, was racist, but I knew it was racist. Like, oh, he's so stupid, that guy. The, and they're talking about one of the players. Yeah. And I knew that I didn't want to go play for one of those schools and be thought of as just one of those stupid guys on the field. So I didn't. I didn't accept some of those offers. And that was for that very reason at that age, when other kids my age were dreaming of pro football and going to play for the Clemson and Nebraska's, I was getting those offers and saying, don't want any part of it at 19 years old because I understood it. Um, and so they love their racehorses and the kids go up to them and say hi to Joe quarterback and Joe linebacker, but they don't see these men as equal. And that's why a movie like the blind side sells so well, because they're selling a little bit of this, this young man's humanity. But even in those cases, the real star of the show is sort of the white liberal person, right? Who sees them as different. So, there's a lot of places to go with that. And you're right. There's not a lot going on. One of the other things I said to the guy, the second guy today, the first guy, what resonated mostly with him um, was, was the celebration. What resonated most with the second guy, and this is connected to this conversation, is I wanted to give him, I don't know if you guys have ever had a conversation with someone where you thought that you were at a different levels so you have to give them something and almost agree to something that you don't really agree to just not to really bowl them down and keep them engaged mm -hmm. so not only did i do that but i said let me tell you something i think is really stupid that black people do politically and something that i think is really stupid that white people do politically so we had to have one you know two, a stupid thing for both and so i said let me go with what the black people do that i think is stupid well no one's going to take you seriously politically if one party never gets your vote and the other party gets it free. Maybe we should be 70, 30, 80, 20 or something, but no one has to fight for your vote. The Dems never do anything for you because you just give it to them. And the Republicans never do anything for you because they can't count on any of your votes essentially, statistically. So that's a stupid thing politically. Well, let me tell you a stupid thing white people do. Well, all the haves have got the poor people, whether they're white or black, against each other. And um, the stupid thing that white people do who vote for people like Donald Trump and, their fi and the financial agendas that they're, and programs that they're voting for are so horribly against their interests, they do it because they hear these buzzwords like immigration and China and riots and law and order. And so stupidly, they just vote against their own interests. But if we all paid attention to this cartoon I saw recently that had someone in the background. So it, it, I don't remember who it was, but it was like a Rupert Murdoch or the Koch brothers and they had wheelbarrows of money and it had like a white guy at a table, like a card table with a Confederate hat on and $1 bill on the table and a Mexican across from him with a quarter. And the rich guy with the wheelbarrow was whispering in the white guy's ear, he wants your dollar, right? And that resonated with that guy. I hope you see the connection. Yes, I do. Um, you know what? I say it regularly. I think the reason separation, I think the government does a good job of separating us. And if you realize if all the poor people or all the people below that tax bracket that the loopholes, the tax loopholes uh, affected, if all of them got together, we outnumber the the top 1%. And, and so it's my question to people right now, and I do this when whoever's the president is, but I ask him, I'm like, would Donald Trump let you into the country? 
Cause I got like five Trump supporters who Donald Trump would not like you, you know, or would Obama come to your house for dinner? Would he value you as a person or would he come to your house for dinner? Would he break bread with you? And I think on both sides of it, you're right. It's like, you can't give your vote away. You have to make them earn it, earn it. That would be the fantasy. If people came together, like blacks and Latinos and votes or, or what we used to do. Right. And I think uh, Bernie Sanders comes out of this tradition where Jewish people and black people have very strong relationships in the 50s and 60s politically, um, or even Asians now, that would, that would be strong. Um, but, yeah. but there's so many people following these buzzwords. So let me get to this next point here in this uh, moment that we're having. Um, and this is gonna be true to Jay Cherie's heart um, on the corporate side of things. Chick-fil-A has given $5 million to African-American nonprofits after a long history of having at the very least an ambivalent posture towards marginalized groups. They did this just last week. Um, I, you know, I read that and I, and I think it's important and I'm glad that it happened. Now, this is where I get a little bit cynical um, because for Chick-fil-A, probably $5 million isn't a lot of money. That's the first thing. Um, right. And again, the question becomes why now? Um, and the question is, will it be sustained? Because it's fine to give it one time. That's great. I mean, and I don't want to scoff at that, but um, will that be continued? What will the support look like? Or would this just be a token to say that you support this community because you realize this community spends a lot of money at your restaurants. And then, you know, when this is all over, does it dwindle off? You know, we see a lot of corporations who are coming out and making statements, which is important. We believe in, we believe that Black Lives Matter. That's wonderful. We denounce racism. That's wonderful. But the question is beyond making statements, what goes on? And I think, Kenny, it was your friend that you kind of introduced me to, right? He actually is looking at what these corporations are doing on a corporate level. Like, what, what does their DNI initiative look like? Do you have people of color um, in positions of power in your, in your company? What, what are your recruitment practices like? What um, is your retention of African Americans when you, when you get them into positions of power? Um, because even just hiring them isn't enough because they might not stay. So those are the, the really lasting things that, that start to matter. It's a great start um, to make a large contribution, but I think it has to go beyond that. How many African-Americans own Chick-fil-A franchises, for example, right? Great question, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or how many are even in African-American communities that are largely African-American and, and without a whole lot of money? Because I don't think you really that. I can answer that almost zero. Right. I, yeah, I can I can tell you in the town that I live in, the what is considered the black area, which is Gentry, North Tyler, there is it's a food desert and Chick-fil-A is not there. And the, they used to have a KFC and it had a plexiglass little rotating door that looked completely different. And this is in modern time that looked completely different than what's in South Tyler. So I think, Jay, when you're saying that it is, it's like, I think so many people right now are like, there's a line in history. We have this moment that, that Kenny keeps referring to. And I think en enough people know they need to play it safe. And hey, I know five million is, is a lot of money. That's a lot of Chick-fil-A sauce. But at the end of the day, is it so that you are on the right side of, of history? Because I, from what I, 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 I felt like I read something or, or saw an article that it wasn't, they didn't come out and say they support Black Lives Matter. They just gave it to African-American um, nonprofits. And it's just, I, are you doing that just to cover yourself and say, oh, we were part of it? Just in case it goes, you know, in case the movement keeps going and it becomes a new way of life, we can say we were there. If not, 5 million didn't do that much to us. Um, the Chick-fil-A's here have not been empty. COVID did not empty them out. So, I mean, they're not hurting. Right. So, you know, I don't eat a Chick-fil-A because it's not kosher. So I have no firsthand knowledge of the food. But I can say that I practice in a community. I can tell you the Chick-fil-A that's in our community has, enormous, has an enormous footprint. Um, everyone looks at Chick-fil-A as very values-based. And I think Chick-fil-A actually trades on that um, they, they're closed on Sundays. They, you know, they have very kind of strict structure about how their staff acts and behaves. Um, you can't even be eligible. You, they won't sell you a franchise unless you've been an employee and working in one of the stores for a period of time. 
But to Kenny, I, I, I Googled your question just to see if it would come up. There's no specific number, but there was an article that came up from 2018, a 26-year-old African-American woman in, New, in New Los Angeles was uh, given her second franchise. She was, she, was at, in, she was 26 at the time, and she opened up her second uh, franchise in LA. Her name is um, Ashley Lamont. I mean, so right. it, it's right. not- So maybe there's one with two. Uh, I mean, so th maybe there's one, maybe that might be the only one. But, but the point I'm making is that Chick-fil-A trades very heavily on the values part of who they are, not just their food. I have no idea how good or not their food is. And I think that sharing a little bit of J Street cynicism is that this for them was part of trading on that brand for them. It was branding. And, but they do seem, you know, if, just in a very quick search, they do seem to uh, walk the walk a bit. There are, it, it, they, they have opportunities and people who own these franchises, by the way, are rich. They are uniformly successful. There is no, yes. Uh, there, yes. there is zero risk in owning a Chick-fil-A franchise. So should the four of us buy a Chick-fil-A franchise? I'm just that's saying. A very strong uh, question. I can be a silent partner. That's about it. Yeah. I know we would not tell anybody. So, so let me speak to this corporate thing a little bit. And I will say the caveat is that the numbers I'm going to throw out are numbers from about 15 to 18 years ago when I was much more strongly involved in these kinds of stats and numbers, I know they've changed. For example, the money that African Americans spend in the United States, this is called 15 to 20 years ago, mm -hmm. was equal to about the gross domestic product of the sixth or seventh largest country in the world, if you looked at it as a country. African Americans in this country may not save money and have wealth, which is basically primarily defined by home ownership, the wealth gap. But now we will tell you a story about where we've gone. We're about the 13th gross domestic product. So we might be more like South Korea now, but that's still pretty sh So go back to when I was more of an expert at this stuff. So I'm back. Sorry, I don't have the current numbers. The, the, the five best gross domestic products in the world were U.S. first, and then it would always vacillate between two and three, like maybe Germany and Japan, and then three and four was like the U.K. and maybe China. But in those 15, 20 years, another thing that's changed, two countries that have popped into the top five that weren't before are India and Brazil. And so things are changing. But at that time, this fifth and sixth, it might be like UK and the state of California, or like the largest, or like would be like the fifth largest gross domestic products in the world. And then right behind them was the money that black people in the United States of America spend, right? And so we used to joke about, and I get to have this levity as a black man, right? It's not a racist joke. We used to joke in North Carolina that we were, you know, 15% of the population, but 80% of the Cadillacs, right? And like, it was, we spent the money even if we didn't save it. And so companies realized that early on. And so you, be, you, we transitioned from in the seventies, you know, when I was 10 in 1977, so you never saw yourself on television unless you were like Huggy Bear on Stocksy and Hutch, and it was always a negative role. So all of a sudden, different Strokes was my introduction to black people on TV. <laughs> right, right. There were those kinds of roles. And so then all of a sudden the corporations realized it and they started playing culturally African-American music and we started getting better roles. And so companies get it, whether it's to be on the right side of history or not, but they know who spends money. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. I think I think that you hit it because I think I my dog is my my husband told me my dog is very excited about this. Okay. Um, I think Ti um, the rapper Ti. I don't know if y'all are familiar with him. He uh, has um, him and Killer Mike um, both from Atlanta. Um, I actually have one of Killer Mike's shirt on right now just to annoy somebody on the screen. Um, but. Um, he has Blackout Tuesday, uh, July 7th. And the reason why he wanted to do that was to prove Kenny's point, was to say, look at what the black dollar does. And everyone who supports black lives, look at what our money can do. Because at the end of the day, we have to accept that America is back to the economics of the Civil War. America wants to make money. And so if we show them the power of that spending money, it's like, okay, we've got to respect you. We don't have to like you. We don't have to invite you home for dinner. We don't have to make you kosher meals, but we have to accept, we have to see the power in your dollar. And here's what's important in that. 
in the civil rights movement, there were many things that happened, right? We can't say one or two things made it happen, but two major things made it happen or successful, I'm sorry, made it successful. If, here's my cynic levity, it's not funny, but it's levity. If they just kept treating black people badly, Civil Rights Act would have probably never passed. You know, just continue to treat them terribly. But when Bull Connor started beating people on national television, trying to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and the world saw it and was outraged, and the rest of the country saw it, and it took sort of, as old people say, took hold, people were outraged, and it was enough is enough is enough, even people who have been af af um, um, apathetic about it. And I think that there's a corollary to the George Floyd eight minutes and 40 seconds. Mm -hmm. The world saw this. It wasn't just another drive-by media story. The world saw this and people became outrageous, outrageous and said enough is enough is enough. Another thing that was very important in the uh, civil rights movement was the Montgomery bus boycott. They mm -hmm. got together and said, let's show you what our dollars do. And they were committed and did not ride those buses and it changed things. Um, yeah. In Memphis, when Martin Luther King came to Memphis on that trip that he was assassinated on, he was there dealing with the garbage um, sanita uh, sanitation workers strike. They mm -hmm. were shutting that thing down and the, and the garbage was piling up. Now that wasn't about the African-American dollar, but that was about the African-American workforce. And right, yeah. That had a lot of African-Americans. And so in a way it was about dollars, right? And so those things were important. So we've got the George Floyd, Floyd tape, unfortunately, going on. But to bring us to this moment, but what's going to happen economically? Are we committed to do something economically and not just locally, but on a national scale? So those two points are major together. Yes. So and I think that kind of ties in, though, to what we were saying um, when we last met, you know, the protests are fine, but what comes next, right? What comes next? It's not enough to just protest or march. And so right. when it comes to, when we look at the civil rights movement and the discipline that they exercised, right? That, I mean, that bus boycott, like walk to work, right? Yeah. For an, and not just like for a day or, you know, just a couple of days. Yeah. Like that is some serious commitment and discipline. I don't know that we have that these days, right? That's because right. even though we have, multiple places where we can spend our money are we willing to stop shopping at like i mean you know there was some question about starbucks and i even had to question myself like can i give up starbucks right but i mean it's things like that we become so comfortable with our creature comforts and are we willing to give them up even when they're substitutes are we willing to say i will not spend my money with you again and then maybe i need to write a letter and let you know that i'm not right and get the whole community behind that until we kind of have that collective effort and discipline, we, we might not see the change we want. I think you're right. They, they, I, I heard someone a long, time ago say, a long time ago say money talks and something walks. walks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, another one, and let's kind of do 30 seconds on this one as we go around. Um, this is important as well because we can't do it alone. And this is about others being outraged. So in this moment, there have been protests in Belfast, Berlin, Singapore, and then even more importantly, there have been protests in Iowa, South Dakota, and Idaho, right? We picked those states for a reason, Iowa, South Dakota, and Idaho. And the attendance at many of these protests have been mostly comprised of white people. Some say maybe 98%, 30 seconds. What do you think, Jay Sheree? I mean, I think there has been over time a change in the world. I think we, we do see a lot more liberal attitudes. I think we see, um, we see more uh, community among black and white people. You know, decades ago, we didn't see that. White kids and black kids didn't go to school together. You didn't see as many black families in predominantly white communities. And I think over time, especially with music, if we look at the impact of like hip hop, right? Yes. The white yeah. community has embraced that and that's yeah. unifying. And so I think that our kids are far more comfortable with sure. just meeting somebody and seeing that this is a friend and not necessarily looking first at race sure. than we may have been. So I think you get more support around the world because there, there is that thinking around the world. Gotcha. All right. What do you think, Elisa? Um, so I'm really excited that we're protesting everywhere. And 
I, I do, I give credit to, cause I do think there's a huge group of white people who are like, all right, if we get together, let's go out and talk. We're going to march this off. However, I think as sad as this is about to say, is it sound that you also have that group of people who, you know, you see the video of the Black Lives Matter people begging white people not to break windows, begging white people not to throw fire into the Wendy's, begging people, hey, don't spray paint this. This is not what this is supposed to be about. And then you and then you also see those videos of the influencers with the fake hammer in their hand, pretending they're putting up, you know, they're they're helping protect businesses. So I think because we're such a social media world and this is such a social media generation, I guess, I guess at some point we just accept that as long as there's boots on the ground, it doesn't matter their motives so, so, of why so they're you there. So you don't believe that there's any positive aspect to that? I think that there is some, but I just, I, I, that's what I guess it's just, I guess there's, we know there's power in numbers. So with that power in numbers, I guess we embrace their, we embrace the power in numbers, but I just, I, there's, it just, it, it makes it hard to look at sometimes. Let's move on to Michael on this one. Thanks, Lisa. You know, I, I'm first, I, I'm not so surprised about countries in the European Union. You know, my understanding is that historically, certain countries in the EU, I'll reference France, had a way more accepting and uh, nurturing um, a, a relationship with black people. In fact, I, I had heard of several stories of black families that emigrated to France because they, could, they felt like they could live in France as citizens that could never be equaled in America. So I'm not so surprised that, um, that the protests in the EU are 98% white people. I am surprised to hear that in the Dakotas and Idaho and these other places Dakota, that, yeah, yeah. that those yeah. numbers that, that are, people are turning Yeah, and to your point, historically, a lot of black artists did that, you know, whether it was Josephine, Josephine Baker or whether it was James Baldwin or whether it was Henry O. Tanner, of the famed artist of the banjo lesson. So this last one I'm going to read, um, we won't go around the horn, I'll just wrap it up because it's the obvious one, right? Police officers are actually being charged and not given attaboys for misconduct based on racial bias. I don't think that requires very much, and we're going to wrap this thing up. So we recognize that in most of our culture right now, it is not cool, or it is cool not to be a racist. Admo admonishments are public and plentiful. Corporate acts of altruism are numerous, and there's a nerve struck by all of us watching an actual murder based on race because of that. So we're having a moment, a moment, a window, a period where people feel like maybe this is wrong, a moment where people feel like maybe we should change. A moment is a figurative term for an unspecified amount of time. It can be seconds or it can be a year. And guess who always gets to determine the length of the moments? We do, you do, those watching. Um, and that means us. And so lot, not letting the moment fade out is now our job. And uh, this is why we're here, keep the conversation alive. So with that, anyone have any parting wrap up moments i think it was a great one to wrap us up on all righty well until next time we'll see you on uh sunday sunday, sunday yep all right bye. <laughs> bye well done bye guys